Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to have a conversation on a thousand brains with a special guest, Jennifer Hancock. Um, so Jennifer, thank you for joining us today. Um, I want to do a quick introduction um, for our audience. Um, so uh, Jennifer is the founder and owner of Humanist Learning Systems and the author of more than 10 books on applied humanism. She's also a top speaker and writer in the world of humanistic management. And she has quite an impressive and varied background, both in the for-profit and nonprofit world. She currently serves on the board of the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. And Jennifer, thanks for, for spending time with us today in this conversation series. So wow. I wanna start by asking you to explain your field a little bit more. I believe you described it as um, having a background in behavioral modification. So can, right. can you explain what that means and what it is you do first? Sure. So I have, I trained dolphins in college and I That's learned so cool. how, yeah. <laughs> and I, I was in Hawaii. It was a great experience. And what I learned was how to shape behaviors intentionally using operant conditioning techniques. And one of the techniques we learn that most animal trainers learn is called extinguishing behavior. And if you took psychology, um, you probably learned about B.F. Skinner. And so you learned a little bit about this and you thought, well, that's interesting. And then you went on with whatever you learned. Well, for me, I was apprenticed in those skills as I apprenticed to become a dolphin trainer. And what I do now is I apply this very particular skill, which is extinguishing a behavior to the problem of bullying and harassment. So I have a mission and that mission is to end bullying and harassment. And we can do that. We know how to do it using science. Um, and that's what I do. I teach people how to stop harassment using behavioral science. Very interesting. So that is yeah, so sorry, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to be the only person teaching this. <laughs> so, this okay. needs to become common knowledge in the same way that Jeff wants how the brain works to become common knowledge. I want this to be common knowledge. So can I just ask a quick question about that? Sure. I, I assume with something like a dolphin, you can give them rewards like fish <laughs> or right. maybe, I don't know what. Um, so there's primary and secondary and tertiary reinforcements that you use when you train an animal and whether you train your kid or not. A, ter a primary reinforcement will be something for a dolphin will be something like a fish. Um, a secondary reinforcement may be um, patting them or petting them or just playing a game with them. Playing a game with a dolphin because they like it will act as a positive reinforcement. So we'll call that like a secondary or more, maybe a tertiary reinforcement. Hmm. And there's equivalent for humans, I guess. It's a, oh, it's absolutely equivalent <laughs> for humans. <laughs> you know, kids want uh, your attention. Okay, great. So Jennifer, when we, we spoke um, a, a bit ago um, after you'd read the book and you were saying particularly, so, you know, the book has these, these three parts. Um, part one really focuses on the, the theory and the discoveries that led to this theory of intelligence. And then part two is on machine intelligence. Part three really focused on the future of humanity. And I remember you said, you know, it was really part one that struck you. And, uh, and tell me if I'm, <laughs> if I'm paraphrasing too much, but you had said when you were reading, you kept saying, this explains so much, this explains yes. so much. Can you, can you dig a little bit more into that? Sure. <laughs> well, Jeff says it explains so much in the book, but um, with my field of background, this explained a lot. And it made me think that this theory is probably correct because it does explain so much. So when we're talking about behavior, we're talking about patterns, right? There, behavior becomes a pattern of behavior almost exclusively. And then, so if you're trying to sh uh, shape a behavior, you have to expose the animal to it and reward them periodically uh, enough to, to get the behavior established. And then once it's established, it's established. And then unlearning that behavioral pattern is its own problem. It's like the hardest thing to do because you've got this established pattern. And so when I think about how behaviors are shaped and become learned and become established, and then I think about how we unlearn behaviors, the I now have, because of Jeff's book, I now have a visual idea of what's happening in the brain that makes unlearning so darn hard, right? You've got all these little neurons and, you know, these cortical columns and they're all doing pattern recognition and they're, they're firing. They get really excited when they recognize a pattern, right? And so they want to recognize, like, I'm going to be anthropomorphized these cortical yeah. columns, right? Yeah. <laughs> but 
uh, they get excited and rewarded for recognizing the pattern because they get to activate and do their thing. And in that context, you could see like, well, how would you train a cortical column to unlearn something? Yeah, that's right? interesting. That, you could do it, but it would be insanely hard because you're talking about a physical structure at this point. Yeah. It's created physical dendritic connections that go, woo, I recognize something. You know, it's right? funny, you talk about um, behaviors as these patterns. You know, one of our uh, first papers we did is, uh, we call it the neuron paper. Uh, this is a, you know, a neuroscience paper. But one of the things that we, we actually laid out a, a very detailed model about how sequential, sequential patterns are learned in neurons. Right. And, um, and uh, it's very interesting how it happens. And, but one of those things is just behaviors. Like you said, like, you know, as you, as you point out, I, I, as a casual observer, I've noticed that, you know, you do these things all day long, but you, you so often you do them identically. You know, you just do, you know, my, my favorite example is like, why, you know, drying yourself off of the towel after you get a shower. You're like, you think you're thinking about it? No, you're not thinking about it all. You, you do the same patch, you move around. It's exactly the same pattern every day, unless you think about it and you can do something different. Um, you know, I'm basically curious, how do you untrain that? I mean, I, we never really talk about that in our work. We never thought about that. Well, um, right. And technically you can't. Right. From a very technical perspective, you can't, um, but you can reduce the frequency of that behavior occurring despite the stimulus. For mm. it. All right. So mm. let me kind of tell you, a, uh, give you an example of this. Let's imagine you have a lab rat in a box mm -hmm. and in that box is a lever. And when it pushes the lever, it gets its favorite treat, whatever that treat is. Um, and then one day that lever, it presses the lever and absolutely nothing happens. No treat comes out. What is that rat gonna do, right? Well, the rat's gonna press that lever again and again and try and get that reward to come out because mm -hmm. it's always worked in the past, right? So it's got this pattern of behavior. And, and, and just as you said, if something doesn't fit the pattern, what do the neurons do? It well, focuses your attention to it. Yes. Yeah. Your whole brain goes, wait, that wasn't right. Yeah. Okay, so that's what happens with a rat. It's going, it's not working. I'm going to press this more and more. And so <laughs> so the way you, ex I'm going to put extinguish in quotation marks. So if you're listening to this, air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> extinction <laughs> is an air quote event um, because it's not technically extinction. Uh, but what happens is you, you remove the reward for the behavior. What happens in the animal is the animal tries to get, if the behavior has been established, the animal goes, wait, I didn't get my reward. <laughs> and it tries again to get its reward. And eventually, if it doesn't get its reward after escalating its behavior, it'll give up. And I'm, again, this is an air quote, give up, <laughs> right? It'll stop pressing the lever. Now this giving up happens more quickly if it has another way to get its reward. So if you put another lever beside it and that lever started working, it would move to that other lever quickly and give up the old lever. But the reality is it never gives up the old lever. It just uses it less frequency, mm. right? Okay. So every once in a while, you've got this rat in this cage. It's now learned nothing comes out of this regard. I could press this lever all day yeah. and nothing's ever gonna come out of it. It will still occasionally go and press that lever just yeah. in case yeah, because the pattern recognition is still there. But if you're trying to create a change someone's uh, behaviors, the undesirable behaviors, don't you want to try to eradicate that behavior completely? I mean, right, you, if, you, if, you, someone's, you, if someone's a bully and they- You do. And they don't, you don't want them coming back being a bully every once in a while, right? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's the thing though. Technically, behavioral extinction is from a practical standpoint, impossible. What you can do is reduce it and redirect it yeah. Right. If you have a rat in a cage and its food lever stops working, but another food lever does work, it's going to make that switch more quickly. Mm. And it's going to use that new lever almost exclusively and only occasionally go back to that first lever. Give them right? an but give if them that an first lever is the only thing that's there, it's it. going to do that more often. But that's why I put extinction in air quotes. We yeah. call it extinction because we're reducing the frequency that this behavior occurs but technically the pattern recognition in the brain yeah. is still, you, you can't get rid of a dendritic tree. Yeah. Well, right? it's interesting. Yeah. Well, you, you can't, but you know, it's interesting because again, we never, in our work, we never think about um, actively 
removing memories. You know, we think about synapses as memory right. um, type of memory. And, you know, we know that uh, synap synapses disappear uh, often. They, they, they don't last forever. So right. you, do, you do forget things. Right. Um, and, uh, um, and we know there's lots of active processes for forming them and for how permanent they will be. Right. Uh, based on rewards, but it's it's just interesting. Never really thought about how you know. I'm not I'm not aware of active processes to remove them. Um, no, which, it would they die. Don't don't they kind of? Well, they do disappear. They shrink out of misuse. Well, misuse, I, it's right? not clear that they shrink out. I mean, you have memories which were formed when you're young and they're still pretty good, and so some memories last a very long time. So I think the way the way a lot of neuroscientists think about a synapse, which is just a connection between two neurons, right. is you know, people think of, oh, there's like a, a strength to this. Like there's like, oh, it's a high strength, a low strength. It's more like a permanence. Right. And it's more like, how long will this thing last? And when you have a really stout synapses, you know, they, 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 they look like big hefty little stubs. Um, they can last a long, long time. And many, many synapses are these little squiggly things that don't look very stout at all. And they can go away right away. You know, you can forget, right. you know, you forget what you had for breakfast yesterday, you know, it's 24 hours later. I don't know. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> um, but, uh, but some, so, but again, active processes, because some things right. can, if they were rewarded, then they could be very long lasting. You right. know, the lever with the rat, or maybe there's some uh, undesirable. And, and that's exactly human. what we see, right? The longer yeah. something is established, the harder it is to get rid of the behavior. Yeah. The, the, the quicker it was learned and the sooner a, a, it stops working or a negative reinforcement is applied early on. Um, like I had a hot dog once when I was seven and I threw up, I have never had a hot dog since because I associate it with vomit, right? It just, <laughs> just uh, the smell is there and I'm, it's horrible, right? Um, that has not gone away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very well, it's a connection. very emotional, emotional sanity, <laughs> exactly. I guess. <laughs> but if, if I had enjoyed hot dogs my whole life and then had a hot dog that made me sick, I would have never made that connection, hmm. right? Because I, the strength of the positive association with the hot dog would have been there. And I, I know this for a fact because when I was in China, um, you know, we, we would get really bad ice cream. I was in China right after it opened in the 80s, and they didn't always put things like sugar into desserts. <laughs> So was, mm. you, you sometimes got really good ice cream and sometimes bad and it made us obsessed with ice cream the bad ice cream that we had because we had already established in our brains that ice cream good mm. the experience of a bad ice cream would just we'd be like the la rat with a lever we mm. would want the i we keep going after ice cream until we got our reward if that yeah. makes sense yeah yeah what do you think, you know, one thing, again, I've never, we, we never think about this idea of trying to forget things actively. Um, you know, the thousand brain theory posits that you have these thousands of cortical columns are all learning models. So there's many models right. of anything you're doing. It's not one place. Um, so you, in some sense, you'd have to try to forget all of them. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, it just, it just on a tangentially reminds me of split brain patients. You probably know yeah, about this, yeah, but I've you know, about you, that. you just cut the, the connections between the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. And they, people seem pretty normal at first until you realize they actually have two brains. <laughs> 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 one, one of them can talk to you because that's, that's the left side of your head. And the other one can't, but it's thinking and doing stuff on its own anyway. And right. so I just think this idea when you're trying to uh, change behaviors of people, you're trying to change the behavior of something that's highly distributed. Right. Uh, in many, Which many is why it's hard to do. <laughs> in many, many different models. And, and even those models different exist in different modalities. Like you have models right. of things in the visual area models. You know, again, I think right. in the book, I use the example of the coffee cup, right? Right. You have models of a coffee cup that are visual models and auditory models and somatosensory right. or touch models. Do you, in your work, do you have to think about those different modalities at all? No. Like, no, <laughs> no, but your two brain thing, we're going back to dolphins really quickly. Uh, dolphins only sleep with half of their brain at a time. Mm, Cause they have to stay swimming the whole time. Well, so. they breathe. Um, they have to consciously breathe. We breathe yeah. automatically. We don't have to think about breathing. It just happens yeah, yeah. with a dolphin. They have to think to breathe. Mm. And so if they aren't thinking, they are not breathing. 
Do they have, do they, is it known that their, that their two hemispheres of their brain are physically more separated than in a, say a mammal? Yeah, they, they sleep with half their brain at a time. Yeah, but they, is that, is there, done a, that. is there a physical correlate to that? Like, like there's, there's fewer connections between the two sides you know, of the brain? I don't know that. I just know that when they sleep, half of the brain is sleeping at a time yeah. and they sleep through cycles of about 10 minutes and they there's usually one dolphin is sleeping and then there's another dolphin watching them to make sure that i guess they don't drown or something um wow. and then they'll switch off but they're what i understand from what i was told is half the brain is yeah. experiencing the the sleep waves that go yeah. through the brain and the other half is not when yeah i'm familiar with the, i've heard i've read that too in in uh, in, in in mammals uh, swimming mammals and also yeah in uh, other fish and in birds that have to fly continuously they have to stay awake half but the, the brain, brain needs to sleep so yeah yeah so that's separated yeah. out and half yeah. the brain sleeps at a yeah. time yeah yeah interesting i'm surprised you don't have to think about the different modalities if i'm trying to a trigger for someone's behavior but there might be an auditory trigger there might be a visual right trigger. And, and that's exactly it we just think of you know what is the stimulus right yeah. there's some sort of stimulus whether it's tactile or uh, visual or auditory or whatever the stimulus is that yeah. triggers the brain and results in some sort of behavior. Mm -hmm. So we, it, it tends to, you know, behaviorists tends to think very mechanically about human behavior and animal behavior. And this is one of the reasons why it's, we, people ask me this because they're like, you're a humanist and yet you're a behavioralist. And that's because behavioralists do tend to think of behavior in very mechanic, uh, mechanical terms, mm -hmm. right? So there's a stimulus and then there's a response to that stimulus. And then there's usually a response to that stim that response triggered a stimulus in something else. And so there's, there's, but, these but there could be multiple, stim multiple stimulus, there like could be multiple stimulus, visual stimulus, you know, like what you mentioned right. the hot dog, it might be the smell. It might be the look of the hot dog. It might it's, be for just, me. It's the smell. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. I can see a hot dog with picture of a hot dog with no response, yeah, right? It's the yeah. smell that gets me. But yeah. what we do is we think in terms of stimulus and response and that stimulus, the modality doesn't matter because it's a stimulus. What mm. matters is that it's a stimulus and we're going to moderate the stimulus and either through um, some sort of command. And then we also have something called a Delta, which is another type of stimulus we use um, and then there's the reinforcements and rewards. And then there's the, the, the interesting part is the um, schedule of those rewards. So, yeah. you know, yeah. if no, I, I didn't, I didn't write about that in my book because no, you know, no, because your book is about the brain. Yeah. I, yeah well, the, well, those rewards manifest themselves in the brain, of course. Right. Um, yeah. And there's a lot known about or Yeah. This, there's a lot of nice pattern. A lot of research on, for example, dopamine release and how it happens and things like that. Um, but, you know, you know, the theory that we laid out is one of how information is stored in the brain right. and um, in its in this distributed in these 150,000 columns, each one is a sensory motor system. Um, and they make these predictive models using reference frames. So I'm just wondering if there are other aspects of the theory that sort of, you know, made, made I don't know. Yeah, I mean, what it, <sighs> Under the know, reference it's frame idea, that, you know. it explains why uh, unlearning is so hard to do, right? Mm -hmm. But I now have like kind of an image in my head of a napkin, <laughs> yeah. and I can I can kind of mechanically mechanically imagine the pattern recognition happening and yeah. the, the the stimulus going in and then a bunch of different things happening simultaneously to create that pattern recognition and 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 escalated up the chain to recognition and awareness right mm -hmm. and also what happens when a pattern is not recognized so that's right? something that jumped out at you yeah we, yeah we recognize. and in the we know in neuroscience we know that when uh, unusual uh, unexpected input occurs there's a lot of activity right there right um it's because we and we propose mechanisms for that uh, why that occurs exactly in detail um right. but the neurons are trying to make these predictions and, well, they are making these predictions, and um, and when right. the predictions are inaccurate, then what happens is uh, you know, normally only the predicted neurons get active. <laughs> but <laughs> but, um, but if there, something happens that wasn't predicted, the whole bunch of them get active and say, "Well, okay, how could be me?" You know, right? And uh, and it's a sort of the just burst of activity. So yeah, like so one of the one of the stimulus we use in training is uh, something called a delta, 
And it's like usually an auditory or visual stimulation, but almost always auditory, depending on the animal, right? If it doesn't, the animal doesn't have ears, you would use some other stimulus, right? Um, but it's usually like, if I do this with my kid, it's a sound like, uh-uh, right? So my kid's doing something and in your, like, imagine its brain going happily going, ooh, everything, I recognize everything. This is all good, uh-uh, <laughs> right? It, and the kid goes, the brain is hears that and goes that I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Right. right, and so now I can stop and pay attention to what that sound was, and then you can positively train up that sound to reward the stopping response. That's interesting. You think of, think of that sort of uh uh-uh as a unexpected. I mean, it's a known input, but right. it's not expected because if. Unless the child knew that, that what they were doing was going to bother you, and they right, say, exactly. "Oh yeah, mom's gonna mom's gonna lay it on me right now." Right, exactly. <laughs> but, I'm expecting assume, to hear the no right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> but I would assume it's more like more innocent child who's doing something and doesn't realize. Right, that, exactly. That, that, then they're going, "Wait a second! I thought everything was fine. What's that noise? Yeah, yeah, I need yeah. to turn and look at my mom because that yeah. was an unexpected noise for mom." Yeah. And if you think back, to, I don't. You have kids, right? Yeah. Okay, so you think back when they were little and you first started using no and they would look at you, right? Um, how you respond to how they look at you <laughs> determines what they associate with that sound, right? And yeah. most parents are usually freaked out. My kid's about to run off, um, you know, the, the, the Grand Canyon rim, stop! <laughs> <laughs> and then the kid stops and you say, Dah! and the kid like learns that this is a fearful thing, yeah. right? Um, they, do that, so, they do that when they're young, when they're teenagers. I'm not sure it has right, it, it loses its effect, right? <laughs> it's the opposite um, effect. <laughs> but they do start associating, they, they do start associating with that stimulus with a type of response. And then, like you said, the brain will predict that response. You, you know, one of the big part of, part of the book and the theory is, is this idea of reference. And so knowledge is stored in literally these, you can think of them as three-dimensional st- structures, but they're not three-dimensional they're in neurons and um uh and it, it's a way for us to understand how how we access knowledge you know thinking is walking through these lo- these locations in these reference frames and does any of that i mean does that kind of level of detail reach you or is it more like you know ice cream well, good, you know, what was you know interesting fish, was, fish good <laughs> I, yeah no I, I think a lot of it is just how much is not we're not conscious of mm-hmm. right the yeah. predictions and the responses. And if our predictions are correct, we, we pretty much don't pay attention to it um, yeah. because it's correct. And we're focused on whatever else is, is interesting in our mind and to, to our mind, I should say. Um, and so I, you know, for, if I'm thinking about a stereotypical bully, um, I don't think they're necessarily thinking, Ooh, I want to hurt this person. Hmm. Right. They just know if I do this, they don't even know if I do this, this is going to happen. The brain knows if I do this, this will happen. And they're, they're responding to the stimulus and the response patterns that they learn. And they might not even be aware or conscious that their behavior is being shaped by these patterns that were learned in the brain at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, they're you know, just that... behaving and responding and what they're consciously aware of is not necessarily what all the brain is doing. Yeah. It, that was a, a little bit of a surprise for us too in our research is, I mean, we, we've always known that certain parts of the, certain parts of the brain are certainly not accessible to consciousness and, and uh, or recall or language. And, um, but in the neurocortex, we, you, you would assume that more of it was uh, not all, but one of the things, you know, we now understand is that the vast majority of the neural tissue, the activities have no way of reaching anywhere else. Most 90% of what goes on inside of each cortical column, it, it really is not accessible to anything else. Right. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I mean, this is an interesting thing just to think about, but right. I guess from a, from a behavioralist like yourself, um, that might present particular challenges. It, um, it really doesn't because we're not, this is one of those things that explained a lot, Mm. right? A a behavioralist is not necessarily, I don't need your permission (laughs) to behaviorally condition you. You won't necessarily even know I'm doing it to you. Uh All right. Um, I could do it anyways, because I'm not working through your consciousness. 
So, so Christine, are, are you working on us right now? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. But I mean, this is the problem. This is the problem with what we call, and I'm air quoting this, brain uh, brainwashing, right? Yeah, yeah. The United States is experiencing um, psychological warfare right now from a couple of countries attacking us through disinformation and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and that works. Behave thinking what you consciously think of is actually a, a behavioral pattern. It's a learned behavior. It's a rewarded behavior. Um, and those th that can be manipulated and people don't need your permission to do it. And so you can manipulate it as well in, the, in a positive direction without, without me knowing, me even knowing that I right. had something I mean, that needs to manipulate it. It sounds scary, but it's happening to you all the time anyways. Um, yeah. It's usually not directed, right? The, um, Victor Frankl once said, you don't have to let your conditions condition you. <laughs> and so <laughs> this is one of those things that, um, like the, one of the reasons why I think how we learn and unlearn should be basic knowledge and it ties into why you think the brain should be basic knowledge, I think, is because how this gets, how you learn and how you unlearn and how behaviors become established, including thought patterns, um, can be manipulated for mm. good or for evil. Yeah. It, the, the tool itself, the technique itself is, is neutral, uh, morally yeah. neutral. You know, it, it, yeah, in, it can in the, be, be it can be used for evil or it can be used for good, yeah. but you can't necessarily defend yourself unless you know how the tool works. Yeah. And we see this with like people coming out of cults. What what got people to leave a cult is a uh, pattern failure, right? Um, the predictions don't come true enough times that people start to think something's wrong. <laughs> Right. Um, or you teach people in a cult about how to recognize cult indoctrination techniques, separate from what they're experiencing, but just in general, they'll try to control whatever, you know, whatever the technique is. You teach them that. Then these tools for an individual become self-defense. Mm -hmm. You can use these to recognize it happening. And then that's how you resist the conditioning is because you understand the conditioning technique. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because at the uh, I, I did bring this topic up at the very end of the book, which is sort of this a, a call. One of the call to actions was the idea that we should, you know, everybody should know how their brain works, right? right. And, and and the same way, I, I kept it pretty dry. In the same way, everyone knows how DNA works. There's nothing political about that, right? right exactly. <laughs> There's nothing political about it. It's just right. It's just like okay, okay, here's how it works. And 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 to me, one of the reasons to do that was so people understand uh you know not only what how knowledge is represented in their head and how they know things but how they could get it wrong right so right. that we are all susceptible to this but what never it never occurred to me that your field actually could be part of that too um that is you know these techniques that you use to be manipulated or people use to be manipulated whatever these techniques I manipulate is a bad word because it could be good or bad. It's just like, right. It's, it, it, well, it is. It, it's a good word because that's what it is. It's physically but what it, it is, but we it, have it, it. it includes manipulation has a morally negative. Yeah, yeah, it, right. It, I, yeah, it, it is an accurate. Tool. It's an accurate word, but it's it has its right. connotations. But um, but interesting. I just thought you know thinking about that as sort of an adjunct. I've already had some people write to me saying, "Hey, that'd be great. I'd like to sort of think about teaching this stuff." You know, and. Um, and uh, the idea that you might have like a chapter on the techniques that people use to do these, just your field essentially, right. um, is an interesting one because um, I don't know, I just, that, that does get a little bit more, you know, politically sensitive perhaps, like uh, when you start talking about it that way. Uh, right, I, you um, know, I, yeah. I mean, because I think a lot of what I do is teach people how it applies to the problem of bullying behavior, like something that almost everyone, including bullies, yeah. want to learn how to stop. Mm. Right? Like people being unpleasant to you is something you want to learn how to stop, especially if they're habitually unpleasant to you. Right. Mm -hmm. And almost everybody has someone in their life who has done been unpleasant to them in the past. So I'm teaching people the science to help them with a problem that they have. And the great thing about it is in order to do it, you have to treat the other person with dignity um, and you have to treat them with compassion. And you can do this for nefarious reasons, but the people who do it for nefarious reasons are very, very nice to you mm. when they're doing it. <laughs> but that's why we call it shaping behavior and not manipulating behavior. Because what mm. we're doing, ultimately, the animal has the ability to re resist conditioning, right? The, the how brains learn and how we learn and how we unlearn, it's, there's a feedback loop, right? 
we might not be conscious of everything our brain is doing, but we can change, we can consciously change inputs if we want as humans. Let me ask you this question, can I, if I could change the topic a little bit. Um, if you had a request from neuroscience, like theoretical neuroscience, like people like myself, that would help your field. Um, is there something you'd say, you know, I'd really like to know X <laughs> about the brain. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be, my, for me, it has to be pretty detailed. It has to be down like, okay, you know, <laughs> neural tissue type of stuff, you know. But, yeah. Um, no, I, you know, like I said, you know, I read the book um, and thank you for getting me a copy of it. Um, and a lot of what I thought was in the first section was, oh, this explains so much because my field is so well studied, right? We have 70 years of research on behavioral uh, shaping and behavioral extinction. And with extinction in particular, there are no counterexamples to how the process works, right? Like none, it's established mm -hmm. science. Like if you wanna talk about behavioral extinction, you're talking about something akin to evolution. It's just a fact of how mm -hmm. this works. Mm -hmm. And um, what your book just kind of helped me visualize what's happening in the neocortex as this happens, both in terms of shaping up new behaviors, but also, um, and again, here's the air quotes, extinguishing um, a behavior mm -hmm. through yeah. attrition. And basically well, you're, you're extinguishing through attrition, yeah. right? The reward just isn't there. Well, you can't as, you know, negatively reinforce something away. You just have to stop reinforcing it. Yeah. And that's the secret to it, right? So it's in, in, in the neocortex, right? The stimulation of the neuron, it stops getting stimulated. What happens to a, a synapse when it stops? Yeah. When it's not being stimulated all the time. Yeah. Well, I like guess we said earlier, some stick around, some don't. Some stick around <laughs> and some don't. Some, yeah. some shrink and some, some yeah, don't. Some things right? that have been highly rewarded in the past tend to stick around for a long Exactly. Time. And that's exactly yeah. what we see in behavior, right? If yeah. something has been highly rewarded in the past, then removing the reward doesn't shrink it. <laughs> it, yeah. just, it actually yeah. makes the behavior. What's happening is like if, if I have a bully and I don't reward them the way they want and I give them a neutral response, right? Um, they will try harder to get me to fit their pattern, like to go back to the pattern they want. Mm. And if I keep not giving them that pattern, eventually they'll look for it elsewhere because humans are free range animals and they will get that reward elsewhere and, and no longer look to me for it right yeah but if you think of um a synapse right it's it's looking for its pattern it gets rewarded for its pattern when the pattern's not there anymore it's not going oh crap my pattern's not there it's just not stimulated yeah yeah it's just sitting silent so. it's just sitting in silence but if it's been a nice strong stable one hmm. it's it doesn't go away it's still yeah. there so if that stimulus shows up again yeah that's it right. goes woo. So you know, it's just again on the same topic here. There's so many things you and I and everyone knows that right. we haven't we haven't thought about in years. I could say like, oh, go to the house you grew up in. Now go into the basement. Go in the back left corner. What was there? Like you know, you haven't thought about that. You know, or, you know and it whatever, was the heater. Whatever, right? But you know, this knowledge is in your head, and it probably hasn't been accessed for you know right. the exactly. thirty years or something, right? Right. Um, yet it's still there. It's right? still there. So, it doesn't go away. But you know, I mean, this gets to one of the things. You know, the challenge for us. One of the challenges for us is we, you know, we work at these very, very detailed mechanistic levels in the brain, and and you try to you want to make it relevant for the world, right? You want to make right. it relevant for people, so. Um, I, I've always, my attitude has been, you know, start with the fundamentals. So you lay down what a fundamental is, what is a prediction? What is memory? How do we structure information in the brain? And then you can move, these are like, you know, like physics principles, so kind of equivalent. Right, right, you know? right. And then you move towards, you can then move over time to practical applications, you know? So Einstein came up with the general theory of relativity, but we now use them to make GPS, right? It's right. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, so, you know, but, but we've, we're still deep down in the weeds in our work. Uh, that's, that's, we have more to do. So it's interesting having a conversation with you because, or people like you, because like, how do we, how do we bridge the gap between them? someone who's really having practical value in right. achieving something and can our work, our work help? It's helped. It's you've sort of explained how it helped so far. It gives you a sort of visualization of what happens. Some of the things that are happening in your head. Um, and that was the genesis of my question to you was about what, what, what else could we do? And maybe it's not obvious right at the moment, right? You know, yeah, I, I don't think it's obvious to me. Yeah. You know, I'd like it, 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 very few people think in terms of the brain as a mechanism, as like 
a mechanism. Right? <laughs> um, and that's kind of, so that on its own is kind of a weird thing, but I also think it takes away some of the, the amorphous nature. When people think of their brain, they don't know what to think about mm. what it is. Yeah. Like most people, they have this picture in a textbook of the side view of the screen matter with this little stick. Yeah. Head, right? Yeah. Right? But, but to have this image of, okay, I've got this, I don't want to say a computer, right? Because it's not. It's a memory. I call it's it a, a memory. memory. It's a memory, a memory system. system. It's memory a memory system. system. But that memory system is stimulated and oh i got neat effects on my thing <laughs> yeah it gets stimulated um and then it raises up enough of those get stimulated in the right pattern combination and it'll trigger things and you, th like one of the things that's um like so free will right yeah. from a philosophic standpoint free will is a very difficult concept it's central to the practice of humanism right this idea that we can choose our responses is really important to the idea that you choose good responses, <laughs> however you define good, right? If you don't have the ability to choose your response, then the whole concept of free will is irrelevant and the choice that you're gonna make is irrelevant. And this has real world impacts yeah. on how people behave. And they've studied this. They know if, if you encourage people to believe in free will, they will make better decisions than people you encourage to believe have no We, we will. could spend a half an hour talking about this topic because right. I yeah, just- but, I, but, what's going on right it has yeah. to do with the fact that we do have this feedback loop yeah. and that the stuff that rises to the top allows yeah. us to make choices that, that I think it's interesting and i um you know i just did a podcast with sam harris and he's he's a big you know one of the most eloquent speakers perhaps on uh, that we don't have free will and i kind of right. agree with him but uh, i do agree but, with him but but i think yeah, you, i do I think, and i don't <laughs> well i think i think you pointed out i always think they they miss the other side of it right and, and the other side i think you just touched on it which is very interesting and uh which is that although we don't have free will um the actions of others uh can impact how what we end up doing right, right. and that's not the, that's not to say oh i have free will in the matter but it, it well it does say is that the actions of others makes a difference and right. um and so but also within right they say that you're responding before you know you're conscious you're you know you're yeah responding, that's true right yeah, yeah. but we Not also always, know but it's clear the way i would describe it is thought patterns are patterns they're habits and like any behavioral habit you can reward it or disincentivize it and over time change the pattern of thought yeah. Right. And we know yeah. this is doable. This is yeah. that there's no question it's doable. You can learn thought patterns. You can unlearn thought patterns. And I think that's probably the mechanism that's helping create what little control we actually have. Yeah. Um, I like Jonathan, how Jonathan Haidt describes this whole dichotomy of, you know, you've got this rider on an elephant and the, the, the brain is this elephant. Right. But that, that would be an interesting question to answer is yeah. how much, how much does the conscious thought part of what's going on have influence over yeah well i you know I, the rest of the neocortex i wrote about the consciousness in the book too i had a chapter on it and and um you know i i find it not mysterious at all but anyway i um i want what i want to know is you give a dolphin a fish what do you give a human you know <laughs> is it just a secondary reward or do you actually give them a lollipop for a kid or something like that <laughs> well you know i mean that's the thing right a lot of times when people are new to training they they only think in terms of uh primary reinforcers i got it yeah. right and the reality is that there's secondary tertiary quartiary yeah. reinforcers and sometimes the secondary reinforcements be can become primary reinforcement. So mm. let me give you an example. If our dolphins were sick and they didn't want to eat, um, but they still wanted to play, they would pretend to take the fish. And then hmm. they would go down to the bottom of the tank and drop it on the bottom of the tank where we couldn't <laughs> see it. And then they would come up and pretend everything was okay and continue to play with us. So they were, they knew if they didn't take the fish, the humans would respond like, what's wrong? <laughs> because, you know, it's like any animal that stops eating, you worry about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but our dolphins were smart enough to learn if they didn't take the fish, we would worry and we would stop playing with them because we were worried and they wanted to keep playing. So they would pretend to take the fish. 
because what was positive reinforcing them was the game we were playing and the relationship yeah. we were building with them rather than the fish. The fish, yep. the fish becomes like, it's not even a reinforcement. It's just Got something it. they, they eat to eat. But the primary reinforcement is the relationship. Got it. So then you start wondering, is lying really lying? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's just that's it's, the origin of it. It's a, yeah, it's a good point. It's taking the fish to the bottom. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna and just, remember that. And we would find out like every week we would drain the tanks and clean the tanks up. And we would find fish skeletons. <laughs> oh gosh. Wow. That's great. You know, I would put what I was thinking in, it validates what you found so far. Yeah. Right. That's what mostly what I was thinking is mm. my experience as with behavior as a mechanical input and output machine, right, um, is very similar to it just what you were saying, how the brain, this theory, mm. it, it's consistent with what we know about how behaviors are shaped. So let me ask you a question. So, I, you know, I'm I'm getting on in years, right? I'm in my 60s. And um and there's always been, I've always had situations in my life where I wish I was better with people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I've been successful with people, right? <laughs> but, but this, you know, it's, it's sometimes I can be, you know, it's difficult, especially when you're in a, a very senior position and you have a lot of people working for you. It's easy to, to miss things, and understand things. Right. And um, um, is it too late for me to learn these things that you, that you use? I mean, is it, is it, you know? No, I, not at all. I mean, it's science, right? I mean, you know, it'd be yeah, interesting. Just but, it, but I'd have to practice it, right? It's, I can't just read it. I'm sure. I'd Believe it or not, you probably already know a lot about this. What, when I teach my stuff, what I'm teaching people is what the science tells us is going on, right? So mm. there's um, stimulus response. There's three types of responses. There's the positive, meaning the animal likes it. There's the negative, meaning the animal didn't like it. And there's the neutral, which is, mm -hmm. eh, you know, yeah. and then there's the reinforcement schedules um, that are, it's either consistently reinforced or it's variably reinforced. And then when you understand how the stimulus, the response, the, the type of response and the reinforcement schedules work together to shape behaviors. Mm -hmm. That's when you can start using it. Um, and mostly what people use it for, what I teach people to use it for is to use it defensively. Right. Mm. Um, and just to become more aware of your own response, because a lot of people, when they're interacting with other people, they're very much focused on their own, how, how this other stimulus is impacting them. They almost never think about how their response is impacting the other person. So if and I want to read about how this stimulus is impacting me, not how my behavior as a stimulus is impacting someone else. So completing that circle mm. and understanding that it is a dance, there's stimulus, your your stimulus triggers a response in you, but your response is in turn a stimulus for the other person. And it just goes round and round and round. Just that awareness alone helps people take responsibility for their side of whatever the dance is. Mm. If I were to read one of your books that would teach me uh, about these things, what would you recommend? It would be the bully vaccine. The bully vaccine. Yeah, okay. this is where I lay it out. And like I said, and that's the defensive part. It's not that you're not going to get ex experience these things, but how do you choose to respond mm -hmm. so that you choose your response in a way that maximizes a positive response and the, the yeah. sort of response you want to get in the other person. All right. right? I'm gonna read. As opposed I'm... to just blindly reacting and hoping for the best and then yeah. wondering why it didn't work. You can yeah. choose your response. And this is why, you know, free will becomes important. And the question of free will, we come back to that is like, can you actually choose a response? Well, obviously you can, but we don't necessarily, well, it most feels people like don't know the <laughs> mechanism of it and they're not in aware enough to choose. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to read that book. I'm going to, I'm going to right, and then and that's what I think your your book is helpful for is helping people. It's just part of the puzzle of if you understand what's going on, it helps demystify it, and that the the act of demystifying things helps people gain control. Yeah, I think it's a good, very good way. That's a good way to summarize that. I think it's I think that's really what put it. Just demystify it, and then then you can then you can deal with it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> this is the reality. Stop well, I think, you know, our emotional, reality. our emotional responses, like if someone says something, uh, you know, I respond quickly and I don't think about it. You know, it's sometimes you just don't, 
and, and you don't even realize you're doing it right and right so of course it, not because it's uh, somewhere else in the primal brain yeah yeah so but just I, you know life my my career my life has been like trying to so much of it in my personal reaction has been trying to trying to recognize those things right um, and that's and, and when i teach people this i say look you're going to have the emotional response and the emotional response is the emotional response yeah. and it's perfectly okay to have had that emotional response but it's always a good idea to acknowledge that you just had an emotional yeah. response yeah. and then try to consciously choose decide what you're going to do about the emotion right it's identifying yeah. your own emotion and then choosing what to do about it but that you know i gotta be honest it's you know it's still I, I think I've gotten my interruption down to maybe three seconds <laughs> right, where, where the emotional shot comes in and I'm like, what? So there we go. That, there's your, that would be the great invention for humanity. If we could, if we could, we could delay the emotional response until mm -hmm. after you, after you recognize what you're about to do. Yeah, but that's one of those. Okay, so we're gonna go. I don't think that's possible, but in the dystopian future. Part. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's Would possible. Would we really want to do that? Yeah, I don't know. But you know, what? this is in the in the, uh, in the world of AI and artificial right. intelligence. People are very, very concerned. Uh, most, much more so than myself about the emotions and gut responses and, and drives of artificial intelligent agents as if they're going to be just like humans. And, um, and I keep saying, but they're not going to be like humans at all. <laughs> unless, you unless have we to got, program it in. That's right. We have to really work hard to get it to be like a human. And I'm not going <laughs> to do that. And even then it wouldn't. It wouldn't. So, but anyway, it's interesting. Yes, I wasn't really suggesting. I, but I do. I was re I was relating to what you said about that three seconds thing, because I think I'm not in a close to three seconds. Right. I, most people aren't. You know, we're talking yeah. like there are things that can take me days yeah. before I can look one of the things i like the way about jonathan height describes the process is you kind of have to view a your primitive brain and also the neocortex processing about the primitive brain inputs from the distance yeah yeah well, <laughs> and your then brain... this is what i tell my son it's like just think of it as like a whole different brain your cortex that... your cortex has to be modeling it has to well it, it's model it has a model of how the brain right. works and if you don't have that model, then you really, so I think maybe that's the summary of all this, right? Right, right. Uh, the book is this thing, here's a model of how your brain works. You can learn that model. Your neocortex can now understand how itself works. Um, and that at least let you be introspective about right, it. Right, because it's getting like, like maybe, um, you know, a hormone coming out of the primitive brain has been released and yeah. it's flooding the, the neocortex and the neocortex goes, I'm in panic mode because that's a <laughs> panic mode chemical, yeah. right? But if you understand that that's what just happened, it gives you intellectual distance from the physical yeah. experience that you're currently, yeah, currently experiencing yeah. and let, allows you to establish control habits over the panic alarm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, all this is fascinating yeah. stuff. I'm going to read your book, Dex, The Bully Vaccine. Yeah. Uh, I think, Jennifer, thanks again. This is a great 